good morning again. Um, thank you all for braving the weather and surviving the illness. And uh, we're thrilled that you made it through on your commute this morning. I'm Mark Salter. I'm the executive director for the CFA Society of Minnesota. I see a lot of familiar faces. I see some faces I don't know. And this is great because that's something we go for every time we get together. I'm going to get out of the way because you didn't come here to listen to me. I want to thank these folks who are going to introduce themselves in a couple minutes. Thank our annual sponsors who make things like this possible. And thank our moderator this morning, Carol Schweif, who is the deputy CIO for Abbott Downing. Carol, it's up to you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for braving a snowy day. And it, has, it seems like my entire career, I walk into a room full of dark, and I strategically make sure that I'm always the one in the really bright, just to kind of break things, break things up. But we have a, it's really been a lot of fun, I think, for all of us to try to figure out how are we going to do this changing of perceptions thing? And we missed it by a month because the the real emphasis from the CFA Society started with March and the International Women's Day. But then again, we didn't really miss it because we strategically didn't want to make it just about women, even though we're all up here. So take our comments in a little bit bigger, broader context too, because this is about diversity of all sorts. It's about cognitive diversity. I face it all the time I'm in the shop that I'm in has a lot of middle-aged white male banker types in it, as you can imagine, because we're the ultra high network piece of Wells Fargo. Um, but I, I see it in younger white males, I see it in younger females, I see it all the way through the, the um, context of encouraging cognitive diversity, encouraging a lot of thought process, and really encouraging um, different generational viewpoints and things like that and so that's one of the, a lot of what our comments here today they might initially come across because we're asking each each woman to share her career path but we're also trying to focus and we spend a lot of time putting questions and stuff together because we really want to focus on the what would be helpful to people as you're thinking about asset management or thinking about a CFA or thinking about any of the different venues that there are in the finance industry. How do we get more people in? How do we get more diversity in? So with that, I'm going to ask, initially, we'll pass the microphone and ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, give the highlights of their career that brought them to where they are, so you understand the context that they'll be speaking with from today. So, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, good morning. My name is Beth Lilly. And so, uh, and I'm with Corcus Hill Partners. I started my own firm uh, about a year ago. Awesome. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. So I was born and raised in the Twin Cities, and I went to school in St. Paul. Um, I was very fortunate to attend St. Paul Academy. And so if you look at my career path, I was thinking about the questions that were put together. and. Um, you know, I went to SPA, and then I went east to school, and then I ended up on Wall Street and at Goldman Sachs, and you know, I had this with this path, which seemingly was pretty. You know, one of the questions Carol put out was, was it a zigzag or was it a straight trajectory? And in the in the midst of the straight trajectory was a lot of zigzags. Um, I would say emotionally, um, just a lot of zig zigzags. And let me let me give you uh, a. You know, I've always been fascinated with the stock market. I was, my mother um, was part of an investment group called the High Road Investors 35 years ago, and George Mars used to come and speak to them of Mars and Power. And so I, she would bring home these annual reports and all this stuff, and so I really have had this passion for the investment business. And so that's really, and I've always known I've wanted to be in the investment business in some capacity. Um, so I went, I was, I graduated from SPA, I was a middle of the road student, okay. Um, I had some challenges in math, so for all of you out there that are not numbers oriented, I had tremendous challenges in math. Um, and then actually in eighth grade, they called my parents into SPA and said, we're not sure this is the right school for Beth, all this stuff. Um, so. Now they are. Yeah, exactly. They call and ask for donations, right? <laughs> it's like, where's Miss Wheeler? 
Callahan and all this. <laughs> um, and then I went to a, a, an okay school on the East Coast, Hobart William Smith. It wasn't Harvard, it wasn't Yale, it wasn't Princeton. Um, and I always knew I wanted to be in the investment business. So I went to New York um, and slept on my brother's couch for six months and pounded the pavement and looked for a job. And thought I wanted to be an investment banker. And because at that point in time, that was a more glamorous business and you made a lot of money. Um, and my resume ended up in the research department at Goldman Sachs because I had written this scene, my senior thesis at Hobart William Smith about um, international oil companies and the, and, the, and the effect on the economies around the world. So anyways, it ended up in the research department and the international oil analyst brought me in for an interview and he said, you know, what, what would you like to do, all this kind of stuff. So long story short, I got this great opportunity at Goldman Sachs when it was still private. And, um, and, I, and so I worked for this fellow who was on the partnership track, so you can imagine what my life was like on the weekends. It's, you know, and at the end of my two-year period, they said, okay, so, and the, you know, one of the questions Carol had put forth was, talk about these, these forks in the road for you. So I reached this fork in the road. Um, the end of my two years were up, was up at Goldman Sachs, and they said, okay, so either go get your MBA or go find something else to do, because that's how they do it in those times. And so, um, and this is another, you know, as we get into the discussion, I, you know, this business is all about relationships. Um, and just building relationships and being interested in people. And so I developed this nice relationship with this other oil analyst for this firm at First Boston. And he, he and I ended up on the golf course on a Sunday before this oil conference was going to start. Um, and he said, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I love the investment business. And he said, well, I've got this friend who's starting this investment arm up in Greenwich, Connecticut. This is before it was the hotbed for hedge funds. And you should go talk to him. So I got on a train and went up and talked to him. And his name was Bob Bruce. Now, Bob is not a household name, but Warren Buffett is. And so Bob was running the insurance assets for Fireman's Fund. And Fireman's Fund was being spun out from, from, uh, from American Express. So Jack Byrne was running the insurance arm. And Bob was running the investment assets. And Buffett was a consultant. And so I reached this decision point, um, and at that point, I had a friend up in Boston who was saying, come work at Fidelity, and I interviewed for a job and all that kind of stuff. Come work at Fidelity, and then go get your MBA, and we'll get you in the Fidelity system. And, you know, Bob Bruce said to me, if you want to be in the investment business, don't go get your MBA. He said, come work for me. You've got Warren Buffett who's going to come in four, four times a year. He'll, he'll, you know, we'll educate you, we'll teach you about the investment business. And, um, and so, you know, that was that point in time where I was like, geez, Warren Buffett or my MBA? <laughs> Little did I know at the time. So, you know, my instinct was like, take the path that doesn't seem like the logical one, but in, intuitively it feels like the right one. And so I ended up going to work for Fireman's Fund up in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, which was kind of one of those life-changing experiences at the time. I mean, Berkshire Hathaway stock was at $4,000. So Buffett would come in, and we would grill, grill cherry cheeseburgers on the grill and drink cherry Cokes and talk about the investment business. And it was, it, was, it was one of those experiences in my life where I was like, I wish I knew now. I wish I knew then what I knew now. And that really set my, set my path towards this passion at a level in terms of value investing and getting to know management teams, and I really formed my philosophy. At that same time, so then I got tired of living in the East Coast and um, decided to come back here. And Bob Bruce said to me at that, when I left there, Beth, you know what, once you leave here, you're never going to really want to work for anybody else. You're going to always want to have your own firm. And so at that point, in my mind, in the back of my mind, I carried around this notebook and I said, if you had your own firm, what would it look like? Um, 
And so I came back here, I worked at U.S. Bank for a few years and then started Woodland Partners with two gentlemen. And we raised $500 million in 18 months and managed money for a very esteemed group of people. And then about 15 years ago, we sold that to Mario Gabelli. And then I ran the Minneapolis office for Mario here and managed small and micro cap portfolios. Um, and then um, a year ago, to fulfill this lifelong dream that I had had and just this desire to uh, build a firm that was consistent with, with my principles and my philosophy and also to kind of, it's, it's challenging, uh, to raise, have, do something I think is very hard for a woman to do, which is raise money. I mean, you look at, you look at a lot of men, very successful men in this industry, and and they put their shingle out and they've raised a billion dollars in <laughs> not even six months. Not like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, it's been. It's. It, I'll, I'll tell you something. With with tremendous support, like Mary Doherty, who from the minute was just cheering me on to do this from two years ago when I started to talk about it. It's been so fulfilling, so challenging, so much fun. Oops. Um, and it's just, it's, so anyways, it's, it's this great passion that I have and it's something that I've wanted to do all my life. And so here I am, um, here into it, and it's just been this great night. So, um, so that's it. Um, with that, I will talk to, to, to Kate. Thank you. Yes. Well, I'm Kate Kelly, and my current role is I'm regional president for PNC Bank here in Minnesota. Um, that I, is a position I took a little over a year ago, and it's been just phenomenal. And so I'll lead up to that, going back a little ways. I'm from Minnesota. I grew up in St. Cloud. Went to, we were just chatting about St. Thomas, St. Kate's over here. My undergrad was at St. Kate's in economics, um, humanities, which really, was really art history, and um, minor in English, so I took a lot of my courses at St. Thomas, which we were chatting about. It's interesting when you say you're always interested in investments, because back, I think back to junior high, my high school friends will remind me that I always wanted to run my own bank, which is kind of nerdy, but you know, I, I come from a family of nerds, so it's just fine. There are eight of us, in fact, and we're all here in the Twin Cities, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, so anyway, I started St. Kate's, I got my undergrad, and then I went to work for a bank in St. Cloud. This is back in the day, believe it or not, that nobody really was encouraging you to uh, have on-campus uh, on interviews and all this. It was supposed to be living in this little arts bubble, and you deal, dealt with that when you graduated. So in 83, it was a hard market. Um, I woke up thinking, oh, I just graduated, I better get a job. And I went to a, a bank in St. Cloud, who I happened to know the president there, and just started working as teller, customer service, doing everything, anything they need me to do. And within a year, I was uh, opening a branch bank on the West End Forum and a few other things. But then I went to Mr. Deer, one of my first mentors, I guess. And I said, you know, I don't know how these tellers and all these people make it. I mean, I'm living with my parents. I finally got out of there. And, but I said, this is just not a sustainable track. And so he, he was a second father in a way. But um, I said, I'm going to go back and get my MBA, which I did. I went to the UM, now the Carlson School. and receive my MBA in finance. And this time around, graduating in 86, I interviewed like crazy. I probably went overboard. Um, I had about eight offers coming out of there with all these beautiful companies in town. And one was Norwest and First Bank. Now I'm really dating myself. But, um, <laughs> and both offers. I, I chose First Bank because they had a great, they everybody had great training programs. In fact, my class was the last program until now they're it's coming back again. And I chose First Bank for the culture. It's probably the lowest offer, um, but I liked what I saw and the people I met. And that just put me on a track with um, 18 years of First Bank, U.S. Bank. And again, it's only when you're looking back, as you hear the saying, um, that you realize kind of what your fabric is. And my fabric, I now look at it as really entrepreneurial. And I encourage um, anybody graduating undergrad or grad, don't think you have to be entrepreneurial, you know, entrepreneurial by doing everything on your own or starting your own firm, which is really cool. Um, you can do that within big companies too, and I, I didn't know that's what I was doing, but I just was on a track, and I tend to build teams. I like blank pieces of paper, so um, I just I don't find any. I don't get scared by that, and a lot of people might. For me, I'm a little have a crazy gene, I guess. And anytime there's a blank piece of paper and people are struggling on how to build a unit or how to fix a trouble spot, they say, "Hey, where's Kate? Let's get Kate on this," you know. 
And by that time, I was building something five years into it, and I loved my team. I was everything's humming, and I didn't want to go anywhere. They'd always have to rip me out of wherever I was and put me in a new spot. That's where I went down to Oatana because it was a trouble spot for um, U.S. Bank at the time, and how to apply their strategy in a rural community. And um, they were really struggling with it. And I was 30 years old, and they put me down as the bank president in Oatana, and I had to pretend that I was all about Oatana when I really had Albert Lee and Austin reporting to me at Oslo. And think about that, 30-year-old woman, or girl, woman, I don't know what I was. Um, and I had this little corner office in Oatana, and one by one, I'd have all these business owners coming in. And there was one day this guy came in, racing in the corner office because everybody just hated those men at that time in these small communities because when we were trying to make them use a phone, not come into the branch, they are a little ahead of their time. And uh, so they literally come storming into my office and my assistant had this little routine, give them a cup of coffee, shut the door, you know, and then I let them have it, you know, and, or they have it at me. This one gentleman comes in, he goes, uh, there's a damn girl in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, so he, and he just rants at me, and he goes, I know it's not you, it's corporate America, it's, it's the Ivory Tower of Minneapolis. And I, one by one I just said, sir, if you're mad at them, them is just a bunch of me's, and let's just have it out. And just, yeah. um, so that was a little digression, but that was 30, that's one of the trouble spots they put me in. And so every five years I move around, and I got great experience, corporate banking, private banking, investments, trust, I mean, I, it just was a whirlwind of 18 years. At the end of that, um, Bremer Bank recruited me to run five of their business lines. I was um, their trust president, um, brokerage, insurance, and then I built out the private banking group. And here I was probably, not even, I probably was, I don't know how old I was, probably about 40 or something. And that story I remember being interviewed and I said to, and they said, well really you're our long shot because we're looking for somebody who's been a trust president for 20 years in the brokerage industry for 20, insurance, yeah, for 20, and, and knows private banking. I said, well, sir, uh, that person's been dead by 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so for some reason, and I think what attracted them to me is I said, I know how to do this. I would go about it this way. And I had my blank piece of paper, I had a sketch, and they kept having me come back because they said, what was that idea of yours again? How would you do this? And I said, well, just do it this way, you know? Um, so I had a wonderful five years with Bremer. Um, again, kind of, I was at, uh, they were saying, and I do not have my CFA because um, in my roles, some weird way, I had CFAs reporting to me and the chief investment officer at Bremer reported to me. Um, but from a, a slight story on the CFA, uh, he, he came to me once, and this is during the wild times of some product um, generation. He said, well, this one, it, when it, it kind of goes out, and there's no risks on the down, and we're looking at all these complicated products. And I think my simplicity of thought maybe came in help, uh, to be helpful at that time. I said, you know, what goes up must come down. So if you can't explain it to me in simple terms on what the downside is, go back and come back and tell me again. And we got we avoided some pretty funky products at that time. So anyway, that then I w was working way too hard because I had a little problem on the work front, um, a little workaholic. Um, and this job took all of me. I was learning it and everything else. Um, I hated it when people would say, how much do you work for you know? Because the honest truth was I was working 24 seven. And I had two young girls. And you know, I, I, I love work. I ever, loved every job I've ever had. But then I was approached by some investors to start a bank, um, which became Minnesota Bank and Trust out of Edina, a big, big bank out of Iowa, so we could lend up to 40 million. I could do all my fun stuff in the private space and in the corporate space, otherwise it'd be hard not to had those tools, and I thought to myself, okay, I've always wanted to run my own bank. Um, I'm going to work this hard, I might as well invest in myself. And by this time, I know a lot of A talent in town, and I hope they join me, and they did. So I did that, and then I did that for about 10 years, did, wasn't looking to leave, and then PNC calls, and I thought, and I truly tell, and honestly say, it's probably the only phone call I would have taken. I've always admired PNC from my US bank days. Um, they are so big into these kind of topics, they would just love this, you know, and they do love it. Um, and, and so here I am a year later building out a great team. We're focused on large corporate upper middle market at the time, but we're, you'll see us kind of expanding into other segments very quickly. Probably too long story, but there you have it. Interesting. I think I'm learning a lot from these ladies. Uh, I'm Mary Gordy. I happen to be a professor at the University of St. Thomas. I'm staring at it. Many of my students and former students. This is awesome. Uh, 
my career, well, I wasn't going to go all the way back, but since they did, I'm going to go back even further because I, I want everyone here to know my first job because it was child abuse. I truly believe. My father got me a position where he worked when I was uh, 16 years old. I must add, I'd already failed in the waitressing department. So, yeah, <laughs> and, I, and in our home, you had to have a job. And so uh, what I did in the morning is I uh, took in all the checks that this company got and recorded them. We know that now as aging you know, receivables. And then in the afternoon, they had me call all of the old accounts. This was an electrical business, electrical distribution, so I was calling contractors, home numbers, and guess who answered? Their stay-at-home wives, and they'd be crying on the phone, and I'm sitting there saying, you owe us $300 and we need it next week. This is my job. I was 16. I learned a ton. I never, ever was going to be on the receiving end of a call like that. And then I started asking questions. So, and then I have five brothers. My mom had six children in seven years, five boys and me. I think that tells my whole story right there. <laughs> I never realized that I was the only woman in the room when I started in the investment business. So I, I, I worked with Carol way back when. My first uh, career job was, God, what were we called? Uh, first Trust. Yeah, First Trust within uh, First Bank. Uh, and then that morphed into First Asset Management, which is now moving. And, or, and there were renditions between that, I know. But uh, I survived there, learned a ton, got my CFA. Uh, Carol, yeah, Carol showed up a couple of years later, so there were a few women in there, but I followed, they assigned me the industrials. So uh, I went, I remember distinctly being at a meeting with Jack Welsh and GE, and he pointed out one of the analysts in the room, which of course you were not supposed to do, and made him leave because he didn't like his recent research report. And everybody just let him go out of the room. I thought, you are kidding me. But I looked around and I raised my hand. He always called me because there was no one else there. So I, I, don't, I do think he would uh, use it to my advantage. So I, I learned a lot. Uh, so fast forward, uh, I decided to find a temporary solution to a temporary problem. I had, uh, my husband and I had ended up having four children uh, very quickly. He was an only child and he hated it. I came from seven and I loved it. And so we settled on four and we didn't know how hard that was. We had no idea. My mother made it look like a breeze. And uh, she, of course, she didn't work. She worked all her whole life all the time. But uh, she, anyway, I wasn't not going to work. It's just, I just couldn't, I, I'm not, some of you know my son. I love my children, but I couldn't stay home with them. But we couldn't handle it, my husband and I, with the, um, he was an attorney in a large firm here. We were having a hard time managing all that. So I came up with a temporary solution, and that was to be a professor at St. Thomas. And I meant it to be a temporary solution <laughs> to a temporary problem. So uh, when our youngest was in kindergarten, I saw, oh, I, I don't even remember it, to be honest, ages 30 to 35, because while I was uh, doing this temporary solution, they required me to get a terminal degree, so I was going to the U to get my PhD and teaching. So uh, functionally, I was working much more and gone a lot more, but I had these fabulous students that would come into the house, and they, they helped me manage this whole situation. So uh, I, don't, I, I really don't remember it, but I do know that the CEO or Mystic Lake Casino is my former student. She was my TA during the time, and she told me all this stuff I said sounds just like me. She loved it. We, it all looked out great. So, but then I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm going to go back into the industry. And I thought, oh, no, I can't do that because this is really kind of fun. I really liked the teaching. But truth be told, I wanted to monetize it, right? I needed to, uh, I wanted to be a contributor. I forgot to mention that my father always said to, to me at the dinner table, like every night, uh, you need to have a career because I never want you to have to depend on a man for your money. And I, then I called all these women at home and they were like, my husband, we don't have any money. I thought, so I did not like it that I was, I didn't feel I was contributing monetarily the way I knew I could. So uh, I have USA Bank to thank for that or Nuveen or, or someone, uh, that whatever the organization was then because they brought me in to start as a consultant. And uh, I'd asked them about it, and they thought that was a great idea. So I met a lot with their clients 
um, as an unbiased source to explain to them what's going on. Um, and, and the kind of questions they should ask their investment manager and, and all of that. So that, that was my first foyer, but then I decided that I could do better than that. <laughs> and uh, I ultimately started working with do-it-yourselfers, all women, that wanted to learn more. They, uh, a lot of them turned out being divorced and they had this pool of cash and they did not want to rely on the previous person that managed their money for obvious reasons. And they wanted to know more. So I loved doing that. I did that for quite, uh, quite some time. But what I also was able to do from that was really what changed my career is I wanted to, I, it was quite obvious to me that their capital came from their private business ownership. So I was able to parlay that into meeting uh, a lot of the, uh, I guess I would call them the change team, the, the people that actually managed the businesses. And the owners, the owners needed a lot of assistance. I had a friend that was a psychologist that was working with them on the, the complicated side, but he didn't understand the business side. And many of these women already trusted me, so they recommended me to the firms that they owned, or they owned through marriage, et cetera. And I ended up working with a lot of the family businesses to set up boards. Uh, basically, how do you add value to your business and it's keep the family out of it and, and, and have, have, keep them happy. Their shareholders, they deserve to know this, this, and this, and how do you do it? So, a long story short, I am now, uh, I've stopped, I really am trying not to do any more consulting because it's so time consuming because I serve on uh, some boards. So, I've been, I'm on uh, currently four boards. One is Mars and Power, which is an investment company board that's a perfect fit for me, of course. That isn't a family business, it's different. Uh, but the other three are all family businesses. They've all set up fiduciary boards. Uh, I've never, they're not, I, I, I can't be on a board of a company that I consulted with. I think that's a conflict of interest. So uh, these are, uh, I get referrals through, through that. And uh, I still teach at St. Thomas, and it's awesome. So my temporary solution has been a permanent, wonderful thing. So. That's what I do. I'll give you a little bit of background on I mean, Mary and I did work together in the in the beginning, and it's interesting because for some reason I never picked up that your husband was an only child and wanted a bigger family because I'm an only child and did three kids in three and a half years too. Mm -hmm. So there was there's some similarities there. Unlike hang on a sec. Unlike um, others, I did not know I wanted to be in the investment business or the finance business. Thank you. Um, it sort of came happenstance. I too graduated in the spring of 1983, right in the pit of what was the last double digit unemployment status. And so yeah. you applied for whatever you could. And I actually, the one thing that I knew that I always wanted to do, I thought, was be a horse trainer. So, yes, I have a double major in equestrian science and business, which is actually a real conversation starter when people key in on that on my resume. And that. But midway through in my college years, I had decided, no, that ethics just don't sync with mine, and there's a lot that goes on in that industry that just doesn't sync with what I want to do. I'm going to get a generic business degree on top of it. But I love my econ classes. I love strategy. I love marketing and advertising. Similar to Beth, I, I did not like math. And that's one of the things that I think is a fallacy about this business, that you have to be real straight and narrow and, and hop into it that way. I did have the good fortune to, um, I was out of town, living out of town where I went to college in Missouri, and the, my next door neighbor was a bank president, and there was an, he knew a broker who had an opening, so I started at an Edward D. Jones office, doing everything that this guy needed, especially a lot of marketing and advertising and things for him like that. And the one thing that I noticed is every time I called the home office, this was back in the early 80s, and they were wired by satellite. Every time I called the home office to get anything done, the only people that knew what was going on, didn't matter what my question was, it could have been a mutual fund question, it could have been a question on a bond, bond payment, the only people who knew what was going on was the research department. And so I moved home a few months later and thought, I've got all this fast experience in the investment business now because I have four months. So I moved back <laughs> on. And I'm going to apply to work in a research department. So I applied everywhere downtown and ended up getting hired right away at Piper to do technical strategy. And it couldn't have been any better for me because it was so well suited to my marketing and advertising. I picked up my CFA 
simultaneous. I mean, I started in December and started studying for CFA in January and went through um, and got it in those three years. So I accumulated all that experience, went from there to First Trust to try the other side of the business, and then lasted there for three years. And I think it was really interesting to me, Mary, to read some of your commentary in the Freezing Assets blog. Because I didn't realize you'd had an issue with them too over the um, your principal year. I'm having an officer of the company. I get six weeks because I'm role modeling to all women out there that you do not need to take time off. Yeah, children. And I was actually six months. Pregnant. All those men apparently <laughs> think that's okay. I was six months pregnant when I left there and got hired actually at Canard. And while I was on maternity leave with that baby at Canard, they called me up and they said. Well, the, the guy who had hired me was someone I'd worked with at Piper, and he said, I'm going to go into institutional sales, so you can either apply to be director of research, or you can work for this other guy that will promote into it because there won't be any other candidates. And this is pre-everything. I mean, this is 1989, so you didn't need to, to open it up or do whatever. And I was thinking to myself, well, I'm 28. I would kind of like a little more experience, but you know what? I can do this. So we applied, and I was director of research there for a couple of years, had a lot of fun building it, and then was recruited away by the predecessor to the firm that I'm at now, which is, we started out as Norwest Capital Advisors. I was recruited by the gentleman who had started it, because a lot of what I did while I was at Canard was try to get the marketing and the advertising and get the name out on our firm and the fact that we knew the local markets better than other people in our select niches. And so that got me noticed by the um, head of Norwest Capital Advisors. And then after he retired, we became Lowry Hill, and then Lowry Hill got merged. Uh, post-2008, we all got merged into the three different ultra high net worth money management pieces of Wells Fargo, got merged into one. We went a year as Newco, and then created a new name, Abbott Downing, which has some really interesting background. If you're ever interested, then let me know. But it's got historical background with the bank, which is really interesting. And so some of the key lessons I've learned, I did not come at this from a very straight path. It was a lot of um, dodging and weaving, if you will, along the path. And it's interesting because a lot of people that I know that are in the business did not come at it from a very straight path. And so I think that's one of the misperceptions in the industry, especially on the asset management side, is that you have to come with a really strict finance background. And many people do, but many people don't. I also work with a lot of English majors, a lot of um, engineering majors, history, psychology. There's lots of different backgrounds that are applicable, especially on the asset management side. And so I think that ability to see opportunity and to sort of dodge and weave your way through and and be willing to grab opportunities. Um, but one of the things that's really struck me is in the beginning, when I was first back home here and working in the industry, I, I was on the board, the CFA board, and I helped with the, the new members. And this is back in the old days when we would pass around the handwritten applications. And at the time, I remember being struck by the fact that only 12 or 13% of the society was female. And then I went through, I had my three kids in three and a half years, got busy working, running the research department, doing all of that, and I really scaled back a lot of my volunteer opportunities until I started seeing the writing on the wall as my kids were leaving school. And I started to panic about being an empty nester and said, ooh, I need to get involved in stuff again because to fill up that time. So when I got back on the board here, and started looking at the global CFA society statistics and the national CFA society statistics, and we're stuck at what, 13 to 18 percent female, or diverse candidates, and that, it struck me that the accountants have got it, the lawyers have gotten it, everybody else has gotten a diversity thing. It seems like, granted, there's, there's issues and bad players in every industry, but why did our industry get stuck there, especially on the asset management side? on the venture capital side, on the portfolio management side. The one place that there seems to be more balance, if you will, are the, the endowment managers and things like that. There's a, a bit more representation by more diverse candidates there. So what happened? And so I think that's something that all of us have been struggling trying to figure out 
what happens, how do you deal with it when you're in a room full of um, gentlemen. I mean, I, I have the opportunity to be able to work both sides of it, if you will, because I've got young white male um, associates and investment analysts that are as reluctant to step up and be confident and, and speak up just because of the experience level at our, at our firm, if you will. So how do we change that? How do we move that needle? And, and um, what exposures have we gone? So I think one of the next questions, let me get my, here we go. Um, talked about turning why points. Why has our needle been stuck for so long? Yeah, why has our <laughs> needle been stuck for so long? So let's pass along and see who wants to comment on, on what they think it is and how do we change it? What do you do in your yeah. own environment to try to neutralize things, if you will, yeah. or encourage? Um, you know, it's interesting. I would say that pre-2008, the, the industry was doing this in terms of female participation. And then the recession occurred, and a lot of jobs were cut, and then women in the industry declined, and I think either they dropped out or, you know, I'm not sure what happened, but, I, you know, I always judge it by when I go to investment conferences. It felt like it was going like this, and then all of a sudden, I was at the Craig Hallam conference after the crash, and the female participation went down, and it hasn't really, it's starting to pick up again, but, so I think that recession occurred. Um, you know, here, here's the thing, and Carol, you touched on it. I, I would argue that this job, and I'm a, I, listen, I got C's in math at SPA, okay? And I was not a math major. But I, I was an economics major. Thank you. My oh, class is a table. Up, I know. Table up here to put all this stuff so, up. So here's the argument that I would make. And, and this is what Peter Lynch, who's a very, very famous investor, said. And I take a page from his book, which is this job is 75% artistic and 25% scientific. So, you know, I, I granted I got an economics major, but there are so many other skill sets that I draw from when I do my job that you don't need to be good at math. And so there's this perception among women that you need to be really good at numbers. And you know, no, that's not the case. I mean, you can, it, it, Carol talked about it, you need to be a good writer, you also, you know, I say I'm part investigative reporter, part psychologist, right? Mm -hmm. You go meet with management. Well, part of the reason I think women are really good in this industry is we're very intuitive. You walk into a meeting with a management team and you can tell the BS meter right away, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I'll share notes with another, with a guy if I go visit a company and he's like, what, what are you talking about? I didn't, no, I didn't see the same thing you did. And it's like, it's that female intuition. So. Anyway, so I think that you draw on a different skill set, and there's this perception that you need to be really good at math, and men are generally drawn to those professions and those, and those majors. The other <coughs> thing I would say is um, there's also the perception that you can't have a balanced life in this industry. I've got three teenagers at home, okay? Now, you know, God bless you, I can't wait till my kids are in college. <laughs> you guys know when I, you know, this morning it was like, yeah, you're in get in the car, we're going to school, I've got to be somewhere, you know. So, but the interesting thing is you don't necessarily need to do this job from 8 to 5. You can be reading materials at 9 o'clock at night, you know, reading about a company. So this job is not dictated by investment banking hours or accounting hours or or being in the office from eight to five, or you know seven to six, you can do this job any hour of the day, and and sometimes those are my produ most productive hours. And so there's that misperception that you need to be in the office doing the job during this assigned time. And so allowing empl employers allowing their employees to have, have that flexibility is really, really, really important. And I think that the onus is on the industry to allow their employees to come and go. And you know, the good news about my job is, I get a scorecard at the, at the end of the day. If the stocks are up, okay. If the stocks are down, but you know, you get this, you have a scorecard about how you're doing, and over time, if you're good at your job, it does not matter if you're in the office from nine to five. 
if you're there from nine to one and then you need to do something with your kids and then, and then you work again from you know three to six and then nine to 11, so be it. If you're good at what you do, it does not matter. And employ, employers need to allow that flexibility for women who want to have a balanced life to allow their employees to come and go. So that's, that's my rah-rah for, for the industry and it's a great job for women. It's a wonderful job for women that want to have not just about their work, but want to have other things outside their work, whether it's care, caring for aging parents, having children, whatever the case may be. Well, I think it's not just women. That that whole mindset right. of equality, I see yes. it a lot in the younger, because younger career couples are wanting to co-parent, which I'm cheering yeah. left and right. And so I think that your concept is very well taken in terms of focus on output and results, not yep. on FaceTime and, and where you're at. And yeah. that can be challenging. So maybe in the commentary that the rest of you two, if you've run into that or how have you, have you seen it? Have you tried to change it? Um, oh, the cool period. Well, not the, the mindset of companies. Because, oh. you know, the for FaceTime. example, I exit interviewed from the company that Mary and I both left and they asked me pretty specifically and I mean, this had been before I had kids, and I was working 15, 18 hours a day like nuts, and I went home sick. Oh, sorry, he's Mark's back there going like this. I went home sick, and they tried to dock me sick time, even though I'd already put in 40 or 50 hours that week, and it was Wednesday afternoon, and I just thought it's not going to be very family-friendly sort of organization. So I gave them very specific feedback on my exit interview, and guess what? They changed it such that a woman that was there who got pregnant a year or so later ended up being able to work flex time. You know, such that, so there's that piece too. So if you've seen that in companies, maybe comment on that too. Sure. Um, a couple, first of all, some stats, not just in the investment field, but I just came from a luncheon and maybe some of you were at it with the results of women on corporate boards. And the, the percentages are in the same category and it's flattened. And it went a little, <clears throat> for Minnesota, went a little backwards this year because of some of the companies that were sold. I think it was the main driver of that, but it's flattened. And so the same per, per, perplex kind of situation is sitting right there. Um, well, I, I would address some of the items as far as cultures and just you know the promotion of women and everything else. I can speak to PNC because I'm new there and it was part of what grew me, but as I got into the company a little more so, this is a culture, um, and if you look at it across the country, it's kind of, and I know somebody's um, going to intern at Johnson & Johnson, but there's some real good cultures that are there, I think are leaders in this area. And what I found, just getting to know the executive team in Pittsburgh, and the other, it's so deliberate. You hire in with the right balance, with a real diverse base of um, qualifications, interests, everything else. But the part I find interesting is that, that they deliberately pull up in the organization two, three levels um, before the, the top post. So what they're doing is they're identifying talent at a very early age and then giving them all the tools they need in the mentorship and the flexibility is really key. Now I haven't, you know, just all the different employers I've had for the, I've always seemed to have flexibility, so I know that's an <coughs> issue, but it's really putting that deliberate part in the culture is kind of what I've seen. But I'm going to turn it over because I think you have a lot more statistics on this. But I would say, in general, it is very interesting and curious why it's flattened out. And maybe it's just a stall because of the recession, but I don't know why that would be. And the other piece of it is is that um, it, it, when you see, they say if you have two or more women on a board, then you're off and running. So maybe we're just at that stall before it kind of catapults. Because I think if we get not just one woman on a board, but you need two or three. And then that starts to shift the culture, which shifts all these topics that we're talking about, and, um, and really let some of the companies kind of take the lead and see. I think one of our points here is long-term investing in these companies in our own careers, and I think we'll see the long-term results with that. Right. Um, well, I'm gonna give some stats there between these two, and when ranked by the number of when ranked by the number of women board directors, Fortune 500 companies in the highest quartile record, 42% higher return on sales, 66% higher, 66 higher return on capital, 
and 53% higher returns on equity. So diverse boards, diverse groups, diverse committees, diverse everything makes a huge difference in terms of mindset and profitability. Oh, there's so much here. I don't even know where to begin. Let me, I'm going to, uh, the woman in board is a whole topic of stuff I could talk to you all day about, but I just want to step back and, and say that personally I'm so disappointed that we have all gone full circle and I've noted it as well, what Beth said. And uh, I'll just give you some anecdotal evidence from just the last two weeks, personally with me. I have a uh, woman that I know well in her late 20s, and she, I ran into her at a wedding on Saturday night. She beeline for me, so I knew she had some news. She's left the business. She said, I had it. I'm done. And it's a local company. And uh, she was uh, just unable to fight that uh, macho culture anymore. And so it exists out there, and I know it, and I hear it from my students often. I have another one, uh, a young lady I know who is pregnant, and she works in a firm with all men, and she doesn't want to tell them because she'll be damned if they're going to take her off the best deals because she's pregnant, and she feels that that would happen. So I said, well, don't let that happen. She said, oh, come on. You know, I'd best let them just figure it out that I'm pregnant, and I'll, and I'll manage it that way. So what is wrong with that? Okay, and it's... It's not just the CFA Society women I deal with, I deal with the Association for Corporate Growth, which is investment banking, which is worse. So, I, you know, the, the case is challenging, and it really makes me mad, and I feel like I blew it, because I should have fought that more for all of you all that time. I'm telling you, this, this movement right now, B2, oh my God, to deal with all that crap. I, all of us did. But, it, you know, you just... I, I had not the time or the energy to fight it because the reality was I grew up with five brothers. I've lived it before. I'm just like, shut up. But you know what? My three daughters, I had to teach them that. And my husband didn't like it when I tell him, you know, this men, this, this, and this. And guess what? I love men. You know, I love all my brothers. And my dad was fantastic. But that's why I'm the way I am. He told me never depend on a man. And this is how men think, and you know, blah blah blah. <laughs> I'm not. I don't mean to throw that under you under the bus because it's. But it, it's manageable, and most men aren't like that. But the ones that are, we never. I, I just let it go, and because I didn't. I, I just thought, eh, you know, I have better things to do for my career. So I'm sorry to all of you that you're fighting that now. I'm really glad you are. Uh, the I have my three theories. I had to write them down so I I know them, but just so I make sure. Why do I think this has happened? I'll tell you, from my perspective, uh, women and minorities, particularly uh, lower income, they do not want to major in something in college that isn't going to get them a job. So we have lost them to the economy. Oh my God, they're everywhere. And they're bored out of their minds. So firms should be looking for very talented women and minorities. I know some that want to switch careers and they could get in, but we don't ha we're not used to that. So we have this traditional path and we need them to, we, we need to think about it differently, okay? Uh, so I do think the number of women and minorities in accounting supports my thoughts on what's going on. Uh, STEM, gosh darn STEM, really good at getting them early on. Eighth grade, they know about STEM and parents love STEM. I did. So I'm like, yeah, so you major in these things. A lot of them are bored too. <laughs> okay, they went and they're out there. And uh, But the other thing is we just need to do a better job. And because uh, people always say to me, Mary, why aren't you sending us these great women and getting more women in, in your classroom? Well, guess what? I don't meet them. They don't choose, they opt out before they get to me. But in high school, I know we do women and women who invest. But the reality is it's so Ivy League centric and Wall Street centric, it's not doing the good for the, us here. So when you go to look at those programs and have these internships, a lot of these young women, they're not gonna do that. And they're not gonna get in because they don't, you know, they, didn't, they go to schools that they've never heard of, right? So I think we need to do something at, at in the high school to combat STEM that attracts girls to this field because it is a great field. 
And the amount of grain in the field. I really felt like I should have I overstuffed my bouncer. Okay, then there, uh, this whole, my third theory is um, when there's so few women colleagues, it, you really get this kind of macho thing going on, or I don't even know what to call it. So I'm on board. I'm on four different boards. Mars and Power is a leader, I tell you. We just got another woman. So uh, Michelle's in here somewhere. Awesome. So the, uh, the reality is that board, I'm not talking about them, just so you all know. Uh, but I'm the only woman on the other boards that isn't a family member. And a family member on a family board doesn't always get the same cachet, right? I get, I mean, just the stupidest stuff happens. You know, somebody will, I, I will, I'll go through and talk about something, and then two, two minutes later, somebody says exactly what I did, and the chair will say, God, that's a good idea. It happens all the time. It's, it drives you crazy. So, but I will not, I mean, I'm not going to check somebody in a meeting like that, because it's really important to be collegial and work together, especially when we're dealing with shareholders, right? So, sometimes I take that battle offline, and sometimes I don't. And I've learned when I can and when I can't. Um, the, the emotion thing. Uh, well, as I, I, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat paid to be emotional because I have to get, motivate my students, right? So I tend to be more in there. But it has nothing to do with emotion per se. So one of the companies I'm on, things are not going well. And so I sit there and I point out this, this, and this, and how I think we could do it. And I can't, I mean, I can't tell you how many times somebody would tell me, Wow, you feel really strongly about that. When the guy next to me is sitting there cussing, saying the same dang thing. I'm like, oh, I hope, I, I hope you got that message because we should all care. But I don't, you know, it's, eh, we're, I don't, it's just hard. And now generally speaking, I'm talking about my generation of men when I'm on boards. There's very few people that are um, younger, which is also a problem with boards. Because uh, I try to, to pull some along with me but they want women that are in the C-suite. Well, if you're in the C-suite, you are working your tail off and you're likely to have kids at home and you just, it's really hard to get even a, a male in the C-suite to find the time to work on a board. And then the other problem is they want this, this resume that, you know. So uh, one of the boards I'm on, uh, after the fact, the chairman, who's a fantastic person, he told me that he really struggled to get them to even interview me because I'm an academic. Well, I don't consider myself an academic. I know I, I know I am, but I've done all this other, and I, and my, the only way I can teach is to be out doing. So I, I had a hard. I, I just thought that was funny. After that, I'm glad he didn't tell me that ahead of time because I went and, you know, sit in a room with seven men drilling me about all this stuff, and uh, that never came up. But apparently, they were just testing to see if I was an academic. I don't know what that means exactly, but uh, so anyway. Uh, that, that's kind of my two cents on that, I can go on and on. So, I think um, a lot of interesting tidbits and comments here, and a piece of it is, is that the example set, I mean, I've only <coughs> said for the last couple of years, because as I started spending a lot of time thinking about this, one of the things that I'm only half tongue in cheek about is the fact that we don't have a TV show or a media representation of our industry that's positive. It's all, you know, the only female representation you can point to recently is Margot Robbie in a, bath, in a bubble bath explaining mortgage-backed securities in the big short. You've got billions, you've got a lot of those things, and it's only half facetious in terms of the example not being out there and not being vocal. And I think the understanding that you don't have to like math, you can come at it from a different direction, but there also needs to be a breaking down mindset-wise, not just male, female of this, but you know, advice to younger people, and I give this advice all the time because I have had the good fortune, I was tapped to set up a mentoring program inside Abbott Downing within the last couple of years, and it's been an exceptionally successful program, which is great because we're very intentional about how we pair people and we pair them across regions and we specifically do things. I also have started some things internally, especially on the on the on the younger people side, some periodic calls. And my biggest advice and to both sides of it, among my peers, I'm encouraging them to try to think through the difference between being a mentor and being a sponsor. Being a sponsor or an advocate for somebody means that you understand 
what people want to do, where they want to go, and then whether or not they're in the room, if the opportunity for a work group, the opportunity for, an, for a presentation or something comes up, I'm throwing names in that hat all the time saying, oh, and we need to add so-and-so to this, and we need to add so-and-so to that. We need to give them experience and exposure and things like that. So there's that advocacy piece there. But there's also the encouragement I do, especially of the younger, the younger set all across. And it doesn't matter. Um, and it's not just younger set. It's other people moving into it and stuff. I give this advice to everybody, and that's to be bold. And it's, it can be difficult. And so I, I like if anyone has any comments on that. Because it can be tough to go in, be bold, be strident, you know, stand up and, and put your stake in the ground. It can be tough if you come at it and you're not a middle-aged white male banker doing it in, in my shop. Some other shops might have more equality, if you will, in terms of that mindset. But I would encourage you to do it anyway because there's, and I've got some resources if you're interested. I sat down last week and put together sort of a, started putting together a bibliography of my favorite books. So if you're interested, hit me up afterwards and I'll, and I'll give you a card and I'll email you the, the list that I have. But there's one called The Confidence Code. And it, it specifically, it's these two writers who specifically were looking at, at women in terms of why aren't they more confident. And one of the things that really struck me out of that book is the fact that we overthink things all the time. And I can't tell you the quantity of times I've gotten up on a Monday morning, early morning workout, and I've realized that my subconscious has been ruminating on something all weekend long. And I stop and ask myself, would Joe think this? Would Doug have wasted any of that time? But I think, you know, we're always trying to say, um, uh, if I go in and I'm this bold and strident, or I ask this question, what are they going to think of me? Or, or we overthink it way too often and it's not just females it's not just people in uncomfortable or in new situations but there's a lot of different situations so if i could leave you with one thing it's be bold be confident um and don't overthink so that's two things that's pretty typical so maybe um since we're running down on time i know i'll have each of you maybe leave with a what what are one or two or three things that that you leave them with, and then hopefully we'll have time for a few questions too. Okay. Um, you know, I would say the following. Uh, for many years, and still to this day, um, I struggled with that imposter concept, right? Yes. The imposter. And really struggled with really So that means everybody knows what I know. Yeah. Is what you. Yeah. It's not true, but you think that. Yes. Yep. The imposter concept, and then low self-esteem, like, you know, and so it took, it, it has taken me, and now that I'm in my fifties, <coughs> I actually am like, wow, I actually do know what I'm talking about. I, do, I, I actually am, I might be an expert in this area. So, you know, I wished I'd known when I was younger, um, I, wor I wished emotionally I'd worked on those things for myself in terms of, you know, that low self-esteem, and I think, you know, it's interesting to make that comment, and 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 I've spoken in a, in a national platform, and I can't even tell you the number of women that have come up to me afterwards and said, "Oh my God, thank you for saying that." So it's about that imposter and that low self-esteem, and working with yourself about, you know, I deserve to be here. I deserve to be here. You know, I love what I'm doing, and I'm really smart, and and don't hesitate to ask questions. And 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 the other thing I will tell you is. The other lesson I learned in all this is to get where I want to be, I don't have to do it with an angry stridentness. You can be really kind. People want to help you. You can be really kind along the way. And people want to help you. And I didn't realize that when I was younger. I always thought I had to be kind of push my way and my will, and I'm going to make this happen. And you know, you got to trust the process and be very kind in the process. And people want to help you, and it's about building relationships. So. Well, I'm echoing back to a commencement address I gave at St. Kate's, and I still believe the three points I shared with them at that time. And one is to be open. You know, perfection, perfectionism is overrated. Um, I think I, I always am trying to replace that with infinite desire. So let go of that perfectionistic piece and just be curious, be open. Mm -hmm. The next one is, you know, don't lose your confidence. You'll have times that you're taking a kind of a hit and you have to rebound and persevere. 
But there'll be times where you're, as I use the analogy of battery acid, you know, don't let it go dry. And if you're in an environment that's about, it's really not a fit, and it's really drying up your confidence, maybe those are the times that you should look at a career change. And the third point is to be your best self. You hear that all the time. It seems like a cliche, it is. But really, if you're striving at that, you will be bold. You will make those moves. You will reach out to people. And in my way, I'm not one in the room to say, hey, let me interrupt you, and, you know, or let me catch you on what you just said. That's not my style, but I will do it afterwards, and I will do it in follow-up. Everybody has their way of how it's going to work for you, and you just have to figure that out. And, um, and I just have to reflect. I'm on the Federal Reserve Board. I, it's balanced 50 50% with men and women and diverse. The leadership there, the quality um, and the thoughtfulness and the intelligence, I mean, it can be done. And when you're in those environments, it's a whole new ball game, and it's great fun to work with. So let's all strive for that. Uh, I, I guess I have two different things. One thing I absolutely learned through my career that took me a little while, hit my head against the wall, is well, I kind of tended to think I was right all the time. <laughs> and uh, it might sound familiar to some of my students. So uh, I realize, you know, I want everyone to realize that even if you might be right and know what the decision is in the end, I have learned through the process of collaborating with people and getting through it and being open-minded that the decision made in the end is a lot better than my first right one was. Uh, so that's hard to do if you're hard driving. Uh, but I have confidence issues, there's no doubt about it. So that's my second piece. I also learned throughout my life to, to acknowledge mistakes. And uh, I've made a ton of them. And guess what, we all have. And I, was, I didn't want to acknowledge those early on because I wanted to always be right. And, and you really need to embrace those mistakes. I, I really try to encourage people to, okay, that didn't work out, what went wrong about it, and what, what could you do differently? And ultimately, I think it's made me a much better decision maker throughout my career. And that took confidence that I wasn't sure I had. But the market was really helpful, because guess what? The market's impersonal, and when you're wrong, you're wrong. So uh, I learned a lot from that, and I, I would encourage you to embrace your mistakes and try to learn from them as well. Do we have time for a couple questions? Do we? A couple questions? Any questions? Yeah. I'm going to just kind of thread the needle on the confidence, because on the one hand, I think you could say that you're middle-aged white male or even a young white male, men are overconfident, right? And I think that's that's uh, the issue, like that you talk about portfolio management, I think that's an issue that men have, is they're overconfident. Um, and I, what I hear you guys saying is, you should be confident in yourself, but you want to also strike that balance, I think. Right. Um, I think you want to be curious, open-minded, you guys mentioned that, question yourself, but, What's the appropriate level of confidence without taking on men's weakness uh, and still taking advantage of what I think is uh, women's advantage is maybe not being overconfident? You know, I'll take that one first because it's interesting because one of my personal biases is assuming that all males are overconfident or like supremely confident. And I've run into a bunch who aren't, especially a bunch, e even in our business, who aren't necessarily especially younger because they might be less confident because they've only got five years in the business and they're working with people that have 35 years in the business, so they come at it that way. And so part of it is, um, I, I think part of threading the needle is to to do your homework to over-prepare, or to prepare and over-prepare, and then be confident when you, when you know that you can back your points up with statistics or with research, but also, and here's the threading the needle part, be confident enough and willing enough to be able to collaborate and sit in that group and, and be swayed from others. And I think it was John Roberts, when he was testifying in front of the, um, for nomination as the head Supreme Court Justice, and they were pressuring and pressuring and pressuring him about how are you gonna vote on abortion, how are you gonna vote on all these other things, and he said, look, the glory about being one of the justices is you expect to have your mind open when you go into those. I can't tell you how I'm going to end up voting 
on some of this stuff because I'm going to pull in and I'm going to listen to all of the testimony that's made. Then I'm going to go back with my team of trusted advisors and we're going to collaborate and we're going to go back and forth and we're going to have that collegial atmosphere. And I thought to myself, man, if I wasn't doing this job, that's the one I'd want. But I wouldn't want all the stuff you had to do to get, I just want to go right to the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want much. Um, Gosh, that, that's a good question. You know, I, I personally, <laughs> you know, here's the problem. I think that men's overconfidence is it breeds itself in insecurity. So, so yeah. So there, you know, it's interesting. If you're in a room with a bunch of guys and you're trying to make your, you're arguing your investment case. I think women are it, the men are as insecure as the women, but they mask it. And so I think um, my experience is, and I agree with, with Carol, it's kind of like, you know, um, my, my, my goal, <laughs> my goal, and, 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 and the reason I think I, I'm dealing less with this self-esteem issue is I've now, I've decided I'm gonna surround myself with people that support me. Instead of seeking out those people that are gonna pull me down. So I, you surround yourself with people that support you and, and mentors that support you, that they see your talent and they're willing to support you. And so that it kind of builds on itself so that you feel better about yourself and you trust yourself. Because at the end of the day, it's about you trusting yourself. You're not gonna get confidence unless you trust yourself, right? So you have to build up your self-esteem through that confidence factor. And so that's what I try to do. And I think now that I'm in my 50s, I realize, wow, I actually am going to start to feel better. I feel better about myself and the decisions I'm making because I'm more confident and it's not born out of this insecurity and this anger. It's born out of this belief that I do know what I'm doing. And so it's this fine balance. Um, and if you have that confidence without that self-esteem, it's not gonna work. You need to have good self-esteem. And that's therapy. <laughs> <laughs> really, truthfully. Therapy, it's, it's because you can't just have confidence, right? That just doesn't come because you've read a book and somebody tell you you're smart. It's got to be inside yourself. So, I'll be real brief. Um, the part as I'm listening to all this is, you have to look at things in a broader perspective than a conversation or that meeting in the room where somebody's going to be bold and interrupting people and uh, apparently confident, which we all know maybe is true, maybe not. If you look at the broader relationship, broader time frame, and the relationships you build coming out of those rooms people looking to you for the person they trust, the person that's not gonna jump and will speak over other people. I mean, that takes maybe a little bit of a runway in your career to develop. Um, but yeah, are we all of us wanting at times to say, oh, I should've been more bold. And yeah, we're always working on that. That's a constant effort. Um, but I think when you look back over relationships and the, what you're, who's around you, um, I have about three people I always can think of. Oh, Mary Brainerd, um, Gordon Beery. I mean, people that had amazingly approachable, soft, comfortable styles, not the big bold, you know, and look what they did in their careers. I mean, I, th I think it's almost amazing. It, but I would encourage all of us as I'm thinking about it, just take a broader perspective, focus on relationships, shore up your own personality, however you're gonna do it, but work in preparing, working your best in the conversation, follow up, there's lots of opportunities. Hmm. Uh, the confidence saying, I bet that I thought longer about what I was wearing today than you two men did. <laughs> it's a societal thing, too. I hate that. I mean, who cares what the heck I'm wearing, right? But I am saying this because I know all the women in the room thinking the same way. I guarantee you men didn't give it one single thought. So that, that's part of it, too. It's our culture. It's how we're, we're, more, we're, we're taught early age to be a little more self-reflective than and uh, that is, I mean, I, I can't imagine, there's probably nobody else in this room that grew up in such a male-dominated world as I did. But we still dealt with that. You know, and then, and then my brothers would say things. You know, what are you wearing, blah, blah, blah. So, what the heck? But some of it is that. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, believe it or not, so I have two experiences just in the past few years that um, people, like men, they indicate that 
there are fewer women in this industry because women are not smart. And uh, I think for our generation, we were raised with the um, perception that women, you know, we are not, we are not smart intellectually. I mean, we are not um, like inferior to men intellectually. So, um, so, so I told my husband about his experiences. And my husband, you know, there are always idiots, so you don't need to take a big deal of that. But that happened a few years, after a few years, still when I thought about it, I still feel regret that I didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. So that was um, one occasion was in a CFA level two review class mm -hmm. in a, a lecturer, you know, kind of said that. And uh, um, so there were only two women in the class. And uh, none of us had said anything. So, so I, I didn't say anything either. So another time it was in um, New Year's uh, Christmas party last year. Somebody just asked the question that, you know, uh, why there are so few men, women in this um, environment? I, I said, okay, you know, I think the playground is not level because, um, you know, maternity leave is not paid and also child care is not free in this country. Right. And, and also I heard men, they can do CFA studies at any stage of their life. So whenever they are dating or they have children. But women, most women, I bet, they did it um, when, when, before they have children. So that really limited women's opportunities to do study, not mentioning the opportunity to find a job or anything. So um, one of you mentioned that you can battle offline or something like that. So my question is, um, when to take a battle I think I'm, um, I didn't react on both occasions because maybe I was afraid of a battle. So I, my question is when to take a battle and how? I think great commentary. And I think if anything, the encouragement I'd like to have all of us is not necessarily to take the battle offline, but Mary, you touched on this at the beginning that, I mean, it's time to bring it up front and center and keep yeah. at it. I actually had one of my counterparts, and I feel like I'm finally in a position, because I held back too long having some of that battle, not just for the young women, but the the people who are trying to raise a family, male and female, and studying for CFA. I've got one young counterpart that I work with and she's studying for CFA three. She just had her third child and the middle one was two months old when she got pregnant with the third. And there's just a lot of stuff going on <laughs> at work too and, and that stuff. And so I think it behooves all of us to sort of Stand together, reach out, have that conversation because actually, this young woman's boss made a comment about Wells Fargo's overly generous maternity leave policy, and someone else made a comment about, oh, we don't think she's coming back. And I'm like, wait a minute. Number one, there is no such thing as overly generous maternity leave policy. And number two, why would you study and put yourself through CFA 3 if you weren't going to come back after having? the baby. So I think all of us to the extent that we can support, be supportive of everybody. I mean, years ago, I tried to set up a schedule among my partners for all of the people studying CFA so that they could take time off to study for it and bring it in. And I got pushed back from partners saying, well, we never took time off when we did our CFAs and we managed it okay. And that's part of the brotherhood, part of the URA kind of on all of this, and it's like, but it doesn't have to be that way all the time. And so I think to the extent that we can all pull together and be more vocal right now and push back, because women, we all have different skill sets, male or female, and, um, young, old, in between different, those of us who live in the country versus those who have lived in the city all along, we all have different mindsets and skill sets that we bring to the table, and that makes us stronger. Different is good. You know, um, this, this, is, this is shocking. So I got pregnant with twins. My twins are 12, so 12 years ago, okay? Mario Gabelli it does not have a maternity policy. You can't take maternity leave. You have to take vacation time. 
okay? Now, here's this $40 billion asset manager. He's got <coughs> 250 employees that work for him, probably 30 are women in the, in the uh, executive, you know, man portfolio manager, all that kind of stuff, and then you've got sports staff and all that kind of stuff, traders, things like that. He did not have a maternity leave policy, so I get pregnant. And I call him and I said, Mario, I'm going to have twins, blah, 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 blah. He says, okay, great. Um, so you're going to, you'll, you'll, you'll take a little time off and come back to work, right? Yeah, fine. So I call the head of the HR and I said, okay, so what's the maternity leave policy? She said, oh, there's no maternity leave policy. Okay? So to this day, I regret not standing up. Because there's plenty of other women. And he, he treated me, he let me take time off the teams and he tried, and women are really good at that. Didn't dock me pay, all that kind of stuff. And we had a nice relationship, but what about all the other women in that organization that he didn't pay while they were gone? And to this day, I regret not standing up and saying, geez, this isn't fair. You know, I mean, take that to the Labor Relations Board, right? So there's a lot of discrimination that occurs, and like you, to this day, I regret not saying something and standing up. And I was afraid. I was afraid. Who's going to take on this huge man on Wall Street about no maternity leave policy? Well, and I think you having the bravery to bring it up and to raise the issue. We all need to keep bringing it yep. up and raising the issue and saying so that it, Yep. I had another situation recently, and someone said to me, well, did you say anything to that person? And, and it dawned on me I hadn't even thought to. So until we start saying we need to say something, yep, I'm not going to. Oh, that was my very point. You just said it now. I think you bringing it up now had more impact than if you would have said it to some individual who it wouldn't have penetrated. I mean, it wouldn't have made any sense. Yeah. So you just brought it up. So you can put that behind you. And I think you'll always, we'll always be working on this. Yeah. So next time we'll bring it up again. Yeah. So I'm just saying hats off to you. And I wouldn't let the, and the, we are, I obviously some of us had fathers that were just like, you can do anything. My dad was just like almost embarrassing to bring college friends home because why are you going to adopt her? Well, you know, she'll all day, you know? So very strong, you know, I, that's how I was raised. He's like, you know, sky's the limit, whatever. So that that's the encouragement we need to be around. And when you're around those people, you're going to bump into them. I call them the wet blankets, um, the dementors of the world, and you just, you have to deal with them, but you don't have to have long-term relationships with them. And guess what? All of a sudden, the companies that have the right cultures win. The ones that don't will be flatlined or worse. And so you just have to have, and not to, but here's my father's word of advice, don't let the bastards get you down. Yeah. That's, I, I think about that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, truth be told, that's why I didn't do it. I, it didn't bother me enough. I decided I don't have time to deal with that, but I realized after the fact that I didn't help anyone behind me. Carol just gave an example. I just went, okay, I'll take the six weeks, I'll figure it out. I'm not gonna fight that battle because I have to, I was in the middle of my CFA program. I was, all that stuff. And so, you know what? Uh, I brought up the bit uh, uh, at the board level when I take on the battles and when I don't. And one thing I do, and you men in the room are going this absolute ludicrous. I know every man's favorite sports team in every city, so that I, and I keep up, I look, when I prepare for a board meeting, I look to see what's happening uh, with those stupid teams, so that I can be there in the gauge, because that's how the meeting starts. You're on board with all men, you're talking sports. And guess what? Thank God I know how to golf. Because I golf, and all they care about, I figured out, was my drives. So if I get a drive in the fairway, then they think I'm powering every hole because they're on their own, you know. And and I happen to know how to drive well, but Beth is the golfer. She's amazing. But guess what? They don't care anymore. So you, pl I play their game, okay? And I and I love these guys, really. I do. The and and so how I pick my battles though is this emotion comment. It really bugged me about how how I cared so much. So I had a, a private conversation with that person, and I just told him, you know what you said, and here's what I heard. You're very emotional. And when you say that to a woman, uh, that gets our, you know, our little ears going. And he said, I never even thought of that. He hadn't even thought of it. And, but they're not always like that. So the time when I had had it, 
numerous times where the idea was somebody else's. And uh, ultimately, this person said to me, well, you did work in the industry, so you're, you're involved in a world where they don't see it that way. And it actually had to do with um, e-commerce. And he thought because I worked with all young people that my view of their industry changing quickly was way too quick for them. Oh my God, he was a dinosaur. But I, 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 so I had this private conversation with him afterwards about it and I said, I know you think it's because I'm with this young group, but the other boards, other companies I've been working with are well ahead and you have to be and, and, and this is all changing. And you said that we have 10 years, I don't believe that for a minute. And can we open it up again for conversation the next time I'll send you some material. So I am noted on all of the boards I'm on. I send a lot of uh, research or written material. And it isn't because I don't think uh, that I write. As you know, I already said I always think I write. <laughs> but I wanted to be collaborative and everybody come to this together. So when I lose and I see the topic, I try to find things to support it that aren't just me saying it. Uh, and, it, and that seems to work well. And I don't think it's because they don't believe me either. It's just, everybody's busy. So if I can give some real facts and then we can open the conversation again. But I, and, and sometimes I just let it go because I don't think it's worth it. One other, two other thoughts that strike me. Number one, try to find advocate or, or sponsor or someone inside or outside your firm that you can talk through these things with too who can support you. One, and I've, I know at my firm I've taken it on myself. I had that, that exact situation. I was in a meeting, young woman we, I'd been encouraging to stand up and, and speak her mind did. And a senior guy leveled at her, wow, you're really emotional about that. So I looped back with him afterwards, one-on-one, -on -one, and said, when you attach the word emotional, aim, aim it at a female, you're putting this. And he, his comment was, wow, I didn't even realize that. One of the things I'm trying to do is be more intentional about different situations, whether or not they're with me, individual, or things that I observe, loop back to my male partners and help them understand some of it, because we are so, it's 10 to 1, if not 12 to 1 in terms of males and females, and until we get to that tipping point. Unlike Mary, though, <laughs> I've made it this far without playing golf, and the sports analogies, I don't have the patience or the time to prep anybody else's sports teams. But it is I have, a waste of time. But I have among my it partners. It doesn't waste. I use it every time. But see, among my partners, though, I every time they come up with another sports analogy, I've said, in our business, you're going to lose half the populace, because if you're making a sports analogy, and that's your common theme, and we're sitting down in front of a male and female partner, she might be the one that likes the sports teams and he hasn't had the time to do with it or inevitably there's one partner who may or may not like it. So I said, okay, every time you guys use a sports analogy, I'm using a labor and delivery analogy. <laughs> see, how that, see how that strikes because, you know, you, oh, you're leaving that. out the whole entire... Oh, I have to put on the goal. Okay. Just so you know where I fall in the golf. Um, I golf twice a year on average. I don't have that much time to golf. But my clients love golfing with me because I pick my ball up and I know the etiquette and I go get beers or whatever and I, I'm just there to enjoy the relationship. And there are clients that can't wait to golf with me and I have the and they say, Kate, you have the best attitude for the game that I've ever met, which is not a compliment. <laughs> Yeah, I would just say that most of the people I play with are competitive enough that if I, unless I was good, I couldn't play. So taking it up at this point is why I don't. So, yes, Mark. I'm afraid that we have to call time. We are way over time, but thank you all of you for hanging in there. This was a marvelous conversation. Thank you, Mary. didn't get answered, send it our way and we'll figure out how to how to get the answers back to you.
were very intuitive. 